you know, we need, we need people that are smart and, and doing great content. And you certainly are doing that, giving a different perspective. Yeah. Thanks. I, I consider uh, Twitter to be the, uh, the bathroom wall to dive bar, but you know, at, <laughs> yeah, least it gets, it at least it gets the message out there. <laughs> All right. Tell us about yourself before we get into, so that, so that people could kind of get an understanding of your background and why you're the guy that we're talking to about this, this subject in particular, which is the military aspect of the recent attack on Iran, uh, the recent attack on Israel or the retaliation on Israel. I don't know how you want to phrase it. And then Israel's position, you know, we're going to get into the military, we're going to kind of break that down, but give us some of your background. So I'm a former United States Army Ranger. I was a member of JSOC, which is Joint Special Operations Command. I did four uh, combat deployments to Afghanistan. I have a background in military intelligence. I've spent uh, a lot of time uh, living in that region of the world. Uh, I just moved back to the United States from India, uh, and I have contacts in Iran and throughout the, the region that I regularly talk to also in Yemen and stuff like that. So I do have a personal network of contacts. Also, you know, I, I pay attention to not just Western media, but I've been consuming media from that region of the world uh, in terms of open source uh, intelligence for years, years, years. And do you years speak now. another language? Like, do you speak Arabic? Uh, uh, I, I went to language school for Farsi, but I'm so rusty and I picked up some Hindi in India, but uh, okay. <laughs> I, I've got a smattering of a bunch of different languages, but English, I'm still American. So that's kind of, you my can life. tell when they're cussing you out. That's what, that's what oh, I mean. That's the, that's the first thing I learned. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. Uh, how long were you in the military? Uh, about five years. I, did, I just did one contract and got out and then okay, I so uh, went to college and then studied international relations and anthropology. Now, would you say, so you say that you're an anti-imperialist, you're anti-war. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm an anti-war combat veteran and part of that uh, Vietnam backlash legacy, for sure. What were you, so were you like this when you joined the military? I mean, I was never a gung-ho Captain America. I, I basically needed a job, didn't want to be homeless, and I had some stuff to prove to myself. So I went through a special operations selection process, and I wanted to do the cool guy stuff, and I made it. But um, it was largely practical. Um, that being said, I did have a lot of problematic beliefs at the time that I was taught growing up, especially with like post 9-11 um, global war on terror propaganda uh, that I've since come to unlearn. And living in that region of the world and interacting with those people, um, the locals on a daily basis has totally disabused me of uh, ideas that I've had about Islam or people from the Middle East or Central Asia as just uh, Western imperialist propaganda. Yeah, I think that many of us have been um, since birth kind of brainwashed to believe that these people are dangerous, they're violent, they're terrorists, they're, you know, living 700 years behind, right? Are these the types of things that you were that you were taught? Yeah, I mean, I was I was a white guy growing up in Texas, and yeah. <laughs> then, I, then I enlisted as an infantry private, and then got accepted into a prestigious unit, and that's when things kind of started to change. When I got a security clearance, and I started understanding how the game was kind of played, and especially uh, witnessing firsthand in the tactical operations centers. Obama's drone strike policy carried out where there just wasn't a standard of proof for determining if this target was a terrorist or a bad guy or not. It was just like, literally, if you were on the wrong person's contact list, you could be eating a Hellfire missile. And for all our sins, we are not doing anything We in the global war on terror close to what Israel has done to Gaza and how they're striking and determining strikes in, their neighbor, in the neighboring countries. All right, let's get into the the latest strike from Iran. Um, mm -hmm. I watched your podcast that you have, um, the Colonial Outcast. Is that what it's called? I watched yeah. the I watched your latest episode on YouTube where you and three other guys, they they all they're all military guys. Yeah, um, one's a former infantry officer, one's a former field grade artillery officer who was a fire control officer in Baghdad during the Iraq War. And yeah, so we all have different military backgrounds and we come together like once or twice a week or any anytime anything blows up to discuss it from a military perspective. Yeah, I thought you guys had a really interesting perspective that I want you to kind of break down here on the show um, mm -hmm. that, you know, what we're hearing in the mainstream media is that this was an epic win, that Israel showed that it's strong, that um, very few, you know, that 99, we're here, 99 percent of all of the projectiles that were sent over to Israel, drones or missiles or whatever, they were shot down. And so this was just this showed strength. You've got Netanyahu coming out now even saying um, he's re reiterating that Israel has the right to self-defense, that thanks for your advice, you know, he's saying about the UK and about Germany and the US, thanks for your advice, but we're going to do what we want. And, you know, he's feeling emboldened. 
What was your take on the strike that Iran carried out? Um, well, you can not be a fan of their regime, but also recognize that Iran is playing chess and that Israel is playing Jenga, essentially. Um, so Iran's strike had multiple strategic and operational objectives. One of them was because they had to restore deterrence. Uh, Israel struck a consulate, which is with, without even getting into the weeds of international law, it's just generally recognized globally that that's sovereign, uh, Iranian territory. That's a, a direct challenge to Iranian sovereignty. They, uh, Israel has killed and assassinated Iranian officials before, both inside Iran and outside of Iran, but that was a what is generally considered to be an act of war. So yeah. Iran had to retaliate in some way to restore deterrence so that Israel cannot, with impunity, do whatever it wants within the region. So that was one objective of the strike, and how they did it was important. They, they didn't do it um, during the months of Ramadan, uh, during Ramadan, for reasons I don't really want to get into, and they're beyond the scope of this particular conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of moves happened before. They, uh, a few days after the strike on the consulate, they said, um, we will leverage a ceasefire in Gaza for not retaliating. Of course, they knew that that would be rejected out of hand. Um, what people don't understand is that when a lot of these uh, public things happen, there's always back channels happening between uh, coordinating between the U.S., Iran, Israel, the Gulf states, because the main play is de-escalation. The only actor in this situation who you could argue actually wants to escalate is Israel, which we can get into later. Mm -hmm. um, so another thing was to restore deterrence um, from the Iranian perspective, but also give everybody involved an avenue to de-escalate the situation. So they shot a bunch of munitions, uh, both drones, mid-range, long-range uh, ballistic missiles at Israel in multiple waves. And they knew that most of them would get uh, intercepted. They were using a lot of old material and stuff. And they scored a few hits on military bases, um, also significant. And they so they proved that they could penetrate their defenses with their old, not their Cadillac new stuff, essentially. I'm speaking reductively, of course. Right. But with uh, old munitions, and it was just a fraction of their arsenal, but it allowed Israel to say that they shot down most of their munitions. So it gives them an out to publicly claim victory and spin their propaganda machine into overdrive saying, hey, we don't need to respond because this was a victory. And then Iran could say to its its own people or constituents or population that, mm -hmm. see, we hit military targets and now they're scared of us. So that is a way of de-escalating on both sides Israel's not taking it. It's like the it's 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 the easiest win for them possible. But now they're talking about a retaliatory strike. The cradle media um, is, is just reporting that uh, a U.S. back channel to Iran has act, uh, asked the Iranian government to allow um, Israel a face saving retaliatory strike against Iran. Iran has refused. Iran has publicly said that if Israel responds to this, we will respond disproportionately this time. So they'll just. Yeah essentially light them up. And the U.S. wants to uh, not get involved at all for a number of reasons, one of which is that if, if Iran can overwhelm the Iron Dome system, which includes like Thad, Patriot, David Sling, Iron Dome is just a catch-all term for all of these air defense artillery systems, um, U.S. bases are far more vulnerable than Israel's defense net. So if U.S. gets involved, well, there goes a lot of dead Americans, if it really comes to that. because Really? Well, yeah. Be, um, uh, two months ago, um, uh, an Iraqi base was struck. Uh, a couple guys had concussions, but that was only from 18, 18 rudimentary rockets shot at a Patriot missile battery on an Iraqi air base, and they got through that. Just 18 missiles, not 300, yeah. which is what Iran sent. So um, U.S. military assets, which is U.S. soldiers and service members are incredibly vulnerable in that region. Why in Not the world? I mean, just think about that for two seconds, right? Why in the world have we defended, we have built up Israel's Iron Dome defense system, right? That's a foreign country. That is not U.S. Americans. And yet we've left service members in the Middle East without an Iron Dome of their own. 
Well, there there are Ruta, there are Patriot missile batteries and other uh, ABM anti ballistic missile uh, nets and defense grids around the Middle East protecting U.S. assets. They're just not as comprehensive. Like right. they won't be able to scram like to protect an air base in Iraq. They're not going to be able to scramble F 35s from Cyprus to start taking down drones in, in conjunction with a Patriot missile battery, uh, which is what happened. Uh, a couple uh, last weekend with what happened in Israel. They're just not as defensible. So that, that's something that all these politicians uh, wanting to say bomb Iran. Well, that's the response. You know, uh, it's not like bomb Iran and Iran's just going to like back down. No, they're going to have to restore deterrence and hit us back. And guess what? If you look at a map of all those bases, well, they can hit all those bases around the Iranian territories. So I, I try to motivate Americans through self-interest to care about not bombing Iran. 